Dear doctors, today we are going to have the CME on cardiac stress testing. The entire CME presentation can be accessed from our website www.drsharma.in. You can also see our previous presentations in the website. Let us look at the spectrum of coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease in majority of the individuals may be asymptomatic, though they have some definite degree of coronary narrowing. As time passes, some of these people will develop chronic stable angina. The next stage of course will be progressive angina leading on to unstable angina. This unstable angina can result in non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Such a patient may recover and may have reinfarctions or he may succumb due to sudden cardiac death or due to a late cardiac mortality or cardiovascular mortality. It is not necessarily that every patient has to pass through all these stages from asymptomatic to sudden cardiac death or CVM. Some patients from chronic stable angina may directly have a sudden cardiac death or they may end up in myocardial infarction. So that is how the spectrum of coronary artery disease is picturized here. However, we all know that the degree of narrowing or the degree of coronary stenosis has got nothing to do with the onset of acute coronary events because the acute coronary events are stimulated or triggered by the rupture of a vulnerable plaque whereas the degree of narrowing is the one which limits the symptoms of chest pain. Let us make a clear distinction between the two important types of presentation of coronary artery disease. One group of patients present with slowly progressive coronary artery disease. They have enzymal pain, chronic stable angina, unstable angina, NSTMI, going on to STMI and cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. They have enough warning signs and symptoms. Their duration of illness is over decades and very long. There is enough time for the coronary blood flow collaterals to be established. There is evidence of ECG and TMT ischemic heart disease. Coronary angiogram will confirm the disease in, in these patients. Prognosis in these patients is very good. Usually they are of the older age groups. The plaques in them, in the coronaries are non-vulnerable plaques. It is the flow limiting narrowing of the coronaries that causes the symptoms and causes the disease. These group of patients form only 30% of the total cases of myocardial infarction. This is a pity because these, these have all the warning symptoms. These have all the time to act, to pull the money, to pull the resources, to get investigated. But unfortunately, the total number of cases of myocardial infarction, these are less than one third. The other type of patients of coronary artery disease will have sudden major acute coronary events. These give us no time to act. They end up in sudden cardiac death or massive myocardial infarction. There is no history of previous chronic stable angina or unstable angina. There are no warning signs. The duration of the disease is very short in them. There is no time for the collateral blood flow to develop in the coronaries. Testing ECG is always negative in them. TMT and CAG are also negative before the major acute coronary event. Prognosis in these patients is very poor. Usually these are very younger in their age. Why the maze has occurred? Because of the vulnerability of the plot. The vulnerable plaques rupture and then attract the platelets and make thrombogenesis possible on the ruptured plaque which causes sudden obstruction of the coronary blood flow. The focus is very important on the factors which cause the rupture. What are the factors which are which trigger the rupture? Smoking, sedentary lifestyle, diabetes, dyslipidemia, infection. These are several theories have been postulated. Which are, which are the cause for sudden rupture of the plaques. Unfortunately, 70% of the cases of myocardial infarction fall under this category. If you do a coronary angiogram, there will be less than 30% narrowing before the major coronary event. But once the major coronary event occurs, 
That is the total obstruction of the coronary blood flow. So, you see, which type of patient is, uh, is, at, is, at, is at an advantage? The person who gives us the warning, who has the time, all the important parameters and signs to detect the disease and alter the course of the disease is much at a greater advantage than the patient who has got sudden major acute coronary event and then end up with sudden cardiac death or massive myocardial infarction. This distinction is very important because all your tests, all your TMTs, coronary angiograms are of no use to diagnose these people before the major acute coronary event occurs. Whereas these tests have got very great utility in those patients who, who have slowly progressive coronary artery disease. Cardiac stress testing. The stress testing for the heart generally we think is only done by the treadmill. But in fact, we have different modalities of stress testing for the heart. What are they? Routine treadmill test monitoring the ECG only and such a test is called in our common parlance as TMT or treadmill test but usually in western literature and all published literature this test is referred to as exercise treadmill testing called ETT. The second type of stress testing for the heart is stress echocardiography. In this under stress instead of monitoring the ECG the echocardiography is done to evaluate the functional status of the heart in relation to the stress. There are two ways you can use the stress echocardiography. One is the dobutamine echocardiography called the chemical stress echocardiography CSE where you inject a chemical dobutamine and increase the inotropic and chronotropic activity of the heart and look at the echocardiographic changes. The second type of stress echocardiography is of course by exercise stress. Exercise stress. That means the patient will go on the treadmill just as he goes for the ECG but instead of monitoring ECG alone we also record the echocardiography before, during and after the exercise and such a type of echocardiography stress test is called ESE exercise stress echocardiography. This is a common addition to the treadmill monitoring of the ECG. Okay, the third type of stressor or stress testing for the heart is the nuclear imaging also called MPI myocardial perfusion index. The MPI is calculated using a chemical stress. Either dobutamine is used or adenosine is used or percentin is used to increase the workload of the heart and see the perfusion of the myocardium using a nuclear tracer either technetium or we use the other nuclear chemical called the thallium. Either stress thallium or stress, stress technetium can be used using dobutamine, adenosine and percentin. Exercise testing is a well established procedure. It is widely available everywhere and it is in clinical use for many decades. But of course, this lecture is not going to focus on how to do this test in a great detail. Although ETT is generally a very safe procedure, there are instances where we end up with some complications like a myocardial infarction or sometimes even fatal outcomes like death are reported. But however, these are quite rare. The occurrence rate is around 0.4 percent or 1 in every 2500 tests. This risk is much less than walking on a busy street or riding a two wheeler in some of our streets. It is essential of course to screen all the patients and choose the right patient for the ATT who will be benefited by the test without having undue risk due to the test. Who are the patients who should be subjected for ETT? In other words, what are the indications for exercise testing? The first and foremost important indication is a patient who has typical or atypical chest pain with 
some CV risk factors and a CV risk profile. Such a patient may not have confirmed ECC changes of ischemic heart disease, nonetheless has got a very good probability of having such CV disease and he is the right candidate to undergo treadmill testing or exercise testing. The second group of patients are patients with unstable angina who developed unstable angina and have not progressed onto infarction. After a couple of days after the angina has settled with treatment, there is a need to do a treadmill test and decide on whether to do a coronary angiogram immediately and start some revascularization procedure. For that reason, it is important in unstable angina group to do a treadmill test. The third group of course, people who had suffered myocardial infarction, not in the first few days of after the infarct, but after the infarct is stabilized, let us say after 2 or 3 weeks of the infarct, it is important sometimes to do a treadmill test to stratify the patients into different risk groups and to plan the treatment. Also to assess whether they will be candidates for CABZ or other revascularization procedure. Sometimes we do a CABZ and after post CABZ we will be requiring to do a treadmill test to assess the functional capacity of the CABG. Of course, in some individuals, healthy individuals or coronary artery disease patients or athletes in order to prescribe the level of exercise when they go home after discharge from the hospital or when they go for work, what should be the level of exercise in order to decide that we may require exercise testing. Is it necessary to do treadmill in everyone around say 30 or 40 years like that. There is no indication or recommendation to do a treadmill test in an asymptomatic individual who do not have any coronary risk factors. In the absence of coronary risk factors, T ETT is not indicated in an asymptomatic individual. Before we embark on doing any exercise testing in an individual, it is essential for us to answer the question is the test going to be helpful for this particular given patient? How to do that? For that, we need to know what is the pretest probability of CAD in this particular patient. In order to calculate the pretest probability, we require the information on the following parameters. What is the age of the patient? Is he a male member or a female patient? Is he, does he have history of angina, either typical or atypical? Is there history of previous myocardial infarction? Are there QFs in the resting ECG? Are there ischemic changes in the resting ECG such as ST changes? Is he a diabetic? Is there dyslipidemia? Does this patient smoke? Based on these informations, there are computer programs where you feed this data into the simple program and then work out a pretest probability. Or there are tables through which we can just figure out what will be the greatest probability for a given patient using this data. The diagnostic utility of exercise testing will be maximum in patients who have intermediate probability for CAD. In those who have very high probability of CAD or very low probability of CAD, this test is not going to yield important gain in terms of the diagnosis either exclusion or confirmation. So, it is the group that are having intermediate probability which are important for us to focus our attention and then do a treadmill test and decide whether they really have coronary artery disease or whether we can exclude coronary artery disease. So, what is typical angina? Typical angina has got the following features. The location of the chest pain, substernal or precordial. And then the pain is provoked by exertion or emotion and the pain is to be relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. So, once again the location of the pain precordial or substernal, provocation by exertion and emotion, relief by rest and nitroglycerin are the hallmarks of a typical angina. When a patient does not have all these features but has some features of angina, such a patient is called atypical angina. When a chest pain is not conforming to any one of these descriptions, 
it is called non anginal chest pain this is the coronary artery disease testing algorithm look at the clinical presentation of a given patient accepting the cardiovascular risk factors combining the clinical presentation of chest pain and the risk factors derive the pretest probability either by using a computer model or by using the probability tables once we ascertain the pretest probability the patient will be classified as less than 20% low probability 20 to 75% intermediate probability and more than 75% high probability for people who have less than 20% probability no more testing is required because their chances of having coronary artery disease is very low people who have intermediate probability of 20 to 75% stress testing is recommended people who have more than 75% probability angiography is the procedure of choice and not treadmill okay let us say that we have subjected a patient of intermediate probability for exercise testing then before we do an ETT we have to assess his resting ECG and his exercise tolerance can this patient walk on the treadmill at the required speed if that answer is yes and the ECG is normal then he can go for exercise testing then if we do a treadmill test and obtain the Dux score it could end up in a positive result or a negative result if he comes out with a positive exercise treadmill test then angiography will be recommended to ascertain the status of the coronaries. If he is negative, no more testing is required. Supposing a patient cannot exercise, he has got some physical limitations or advanced age which cannot permit them to walk on the treadmill at the required pace or the patient has got some ECG abnormalities already in the resting ECG. Such a patient we cannot risk him on the treadmill and he will be subjected to other modalities of stress, stress testing like the MPI myocardial perfusion index or the ESE exercise stress echocardiography or the chemical stress echocardiography using dobutamine or any one of the other pharmacological agents. So such a patient if he comes out positive in one of these MPI or ESE then he will be recommended to undergo angiography. Suppose he is negative on those tests, his probability of CAD is ruled out and no more further testing will be required for him. We have seen the indications for ATT. Now, what are the contraindications for doing ATT? The absolute contraindications are acute myocardial infarction within the first few days, high risk unstable angina, uncontrolled cardiac rhythm disturbances, symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, uncontrolled symptomatic heart failure, acute pulmonary embolism or pulmonary infarction, acute myocarditis or pericarditis, of course acute aortic dissection. Most important of these being acute MI and high risk unstable angina and cardiac rhythm disturbances are absolute contraindications. Severe aortic stenosis of course is a effort limiting disease and he cannot undergo ATT. Let us look at the relative contraindications for exercise testing. Coronary artery disease involving the left main coronary artery, moderate stenotic valvular heart disease either mitral or tri uh, tricuspid, aortic or pulmonary. Electrolyte abnormalities, severe arterial hypertension, when I say severe, systolic hypertension more than 250 and diastolic hypertension more than 120 are contraindications, relative contraindications for ATT. Tachy and bradyarrhythmias, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, HOCM or other outflow tract obstructive lesions mental or physical impairment which will preclude exercise testing, high degree of atrioventricular block. These are some of the relative contraindications for ETT. Okay, our patient has started the exercise test, but there are some indications to terminate the exercise test in case it is not going smoothly. 
what are the absolute indications to terminate the exercise test a drop in systolic blood pressure of more than 10 mm of mercury from the baseline blood pressure with accompanying evidence of ischemia in the ecg monitor is an absolute contra indication absolute indication to terminate att moderate to severe degree of anxiety increasing nervousness symptoms like attacks and dizziness poor signs of perfusion like sinusitis and pallor technical difficulties in monitoring the ecg or systolic blood pressure these are some of the absolute contraindications of course if the subject desire to stop the test is a, is overriding and we have to stop it when the patient wants in fact there is an emergency button where the patient himself can can press it to stop the machine whenever he wants sustained ventricular tachycardia and arrhythmias st elevation of more than 1 mm in leads without diagnostic qw waves are also absolute indications to terminate exercise testing prematurely here are some of the relative indications for terminating the exercise test a drop in systolic blood pressure of more than 10 mm without evidence of ischemia on the ecg monitor st or qrs changes st depression of more than 2 mm of horizontal or down sloping nature with or without axis shift arrhythmias ventricular tachycardias multifocal premature ventricular complexes triplets of pvcs supraventricular tachycardia heart block or bradyarrhythmias bundle branch blocks intraventricular conduction defects fatigue shortness of breath wheezing leg cramps intermittent claudication increasing chest pain hypertensive bp response of systolic more than 250 diastolic more than 115 or relative contraindications for terminating et while we are doing an exercise test what are the different measurements that we will be taking the electrocardiographic measurements hemodynamic measures symptomatic measures electrocardiographic measurements are maximum st depression maximum st elevation is the st segment sloping down sloping upward or horizontal depression number of leads showing the st changes the duration of st segment changes into recovery time st segment depression divided by the heart rate peak is called the st by hr index time to onset of the st segment depression is important ett induced ventricular arrhythmias have to be recorded hemodynamic parameters like maximum ett attained heart rate maximum ett attained systolic blood pressure maximum att double product double product is systolic blood pressure maximum multiplied by the maximum heart rate exercise induced hypotension an ominous sign exercise in minutes and also in minutes chronotropic failure what is chronotropic failure we will see a little later symptomatic measurements like exercise induced anxiety exercise limiting symptoms time to the onset of anxiety after starting the exercise and did the patient exercise up to stage 4 if any patient has exercised up to stage 4 it means that he has done enough work if there are no changes in the ecg tread it is conclusive that the treadmill test is negative if the patient is not able to exercise up to stage 4 then of course we have to look at various other parameters to decide whether the patient is positive or negative in the treadmill test borg scale this borg scale is used to quantify the intensity of the exercise in terms of the patient's perception the scale runs from 6 points to 20 points 7 points means the patient feels the exercise that he has done is very very light 9 very light 11 points fairly light 13 somewhat hard 15 a hard effort 17 very hard effort 19 means he feels very very hard 20 is the maximum so patient is given this scale and asked to rate what he felt about the exercise he has done and that rating is used to quantify the intensity of the effort that he has done what is stock test instead of using this borg scale 
we can roughly assess the patient's ability to withstand the exercise by asking him to speak out while he is exercising. If he is able to speak freely without any breathlessness, it means that he is able to tolerate that level of exercise very comfortably. Instead, if the patient is gasping for breath to speak out a few words or sing a few syllables that indicates that his level of inten exercise intensity is quite high for him at that particular level. So that is how we decide on the intensity of the exercise. In ETT, we often refer to the term MET MET. What is this MET? MET is metabolic equivalent term. One MET means it is the amount of oxygen required under basal conditions per kilogram body weight per minute by a 70 kg man of 40 years. We require 3.5 ml of oxygen per kilogram per minute. This is called 1 MET. If depending on the level of activity, this requirement of oxygen will increase. Sometimes the level of oxygen required depends on the thyroid function, the post-exercise nature, obesity and other disease states. By convention, just to divide the number of ml of oxygen consumed by 3.5, we will get the number of mets. For our convenience, this, this number of mets are worked out by the machine itself and the machine the device gives automatically the calculated mets for a given level of exercise. We do not have to do any manual calculation. Exercise testing can be done using several different types of protocols. The most widely used protocol is the Bruce protocol. This has got one resting stage and six stages of exercise. Each stage of exercise has got three minutes totaling to 18 minutes of exercise and 3 minutes pre-exercise resting state. Each minute of exercise approximately corresponds to 1 MET of activity. Pre-test plane walking is the first or the zero stage followed by 60 stages of graded exercise. In each stage, there is an increase in the speed of the treadmill and the gradient also increases. Initially, the starting speed is 1.7 miles per hour with a gradient of 10 percent. Gradient is the upward inclination of the treadmill platform. Maximum exercise level of 6, stage 6 is equal to 5.5 mph, 5.5 miles per hour with a gradient of 20 percent. There is what is called modified Bruce protocol. When the patient is elderly and the patient cannot take up the exercise quickly, then we require to give him two warm-up stages before the first stage and these stages are 1.7 miles per hour at 0 percent gradient and 5 percent gradient are given before the first stage occurs. And this is usually used for elderly and people with reduced exercise capacity. Otherwise, standard Bruce protocol without this uh, warming up will be used. Here are some of the MET values, key MET values. 1 MET is equal to the basal oxygen consumption of 3.5 ml of oxygen per kilogram per minute. 2 METs is equal to walking at the speed of 2 miles per hour on level. 4 METs is equivalent to walking at a speed of 4 miles per hour on level. Less than 5 METs any patient doing is a poor prognosis if the patient is less than 65 years. If somebody could do 10 METs, medical treatment for him for CAD is as good as coronary artery bypass graft. That means he has got enough coronary reserve and an exercise capacity so he can pull along with medical treatment. 13 METs if somebody could do, excellent prognosis. 16 METs, aerobic master athlete and 20 METs is a super athlete. So this is to say that anybody doing less than 5 METs he is a candidate of poor prognosis. Anybody who is able to do 10 or above METs is a good candidate for medical treatment and the risk for coronary artery disease is lower and the need for bypass grafting is also not there in persons who can do more than 10 METs of exercise. 
anybody less than 10 is excellent and anybody less than 5 is very poor while doing the treadmill test which are the ecg leads that we need to monitor which are the leads that we need to select for analysis of course all the 12 leads are monitored but for analysis purpose lead v5 alone consistently outperforms all the other leads when we look at only inferior leads the false positive changes are very high so we cannot base our judgment of st segment depression or st segment elevation based on the inferior leads alone it is important for us to concentrate on the chest leads in fact the turbulence and vibration is more in the limb leads and least in the chest leads that's one reason chest lead predictivity predictability is very high without prior mi and with normal resting ecgs the precordial leads alone are a reliable marker for cad if it doesn't have previous mi and if his resting ecg is normal it is good enough if we can look at the precordial leads alone exercise induced st segment depression only in the inferior leads is not significant of coronary artery disease st segment depression always should be either down sloping or horizontal which is a stronger predictor of cad but an up sloping st segment depression or simple j point depression is not a useful marker for coronary artery disease let us look at this ecg recording there are three leads presented here v4 v5 v6 both in the resting ecg and the exercise ecg are given in the resting state all the three leads are showing normal st segment with no depression or elevation compared to the baseline baseline being the pr segment but if you look at the exercise ecg in the three leads we see depressed st segment but these depressions are not significant they do not represent coronary artery disease because this depression is an up sloping st depression and the j point depression of 2 to 3 mm occurring 80 milliseconds after the j point Uh, with an upslo rapidly upsloping st segment is not diagnostic of coronary artery disease this response in this patient should not be considered as abnormal let us look at these ecg recordings in the resting state in the lead v4 we don't have any st segment changes st segment is in the baseline at an exercise of 2 minutes 50 seconds patient started showing st segment depressions which are horizontal in nature by 4 minutes 30 seconds the depressions have become much more marked and these persisted into a recovery phase up to 1 and 1/2 minutes such a st segment depression of horizontal nature persisting into the recovery phase increasing with the increasing duration of exercise is consistent with severe ischemic response let us look at this ecg resting lead lead 2 in rest peak exercise 1 minute 3 minutes and 5 minutes is compared in all the tracing here apart from the resting ecg of course the resting ecg is not showing any st segment changes but once the exercise has started from peak exercise to recovery stage we see the st segment depressions with down sloping of the st segments during the recovery phase that down sloping is characteristic and typical of ischemic response so it's important for us to know if there is an st segment depression is it down sloping or is it horizontal if it is down sloping or horizontal and persisting into the recovery and increasing with the increasing duration of the exercise it is classical and significant of ischemic response an up sloping st segment depression which does not extend into the resting recovery phase is not indicative of ischemic response how about st segment elevation during exercise early repolarization is a common resting pattern of st elevation in normal persons it is not significant of ischemia exercise induced st segment in elevation is always considered from the baseline st level st segment elevation is seen after a q wave infarction but st elevation in leads without q waves occurs in only 1 in 1000 or 0.1% of the patients on exercise test st segment elevation is a very arrhythmogenic predictor and localizes the ihd that means if the st segment elevation occurs in the lateral leads the ihd is in the circumflex 
if it is in the anterior leads the coronary artery disease is in the left anterior descending if it occurs in the inferior leads the coronary artery disease is in the rca that is how it localizes the ischemia but usually st elevations in exercise diseases are not common and uh, we have to be looking for them if they are there they are indicative of these changes that are suggested what are major acute coronary events major acute coronary events are mains include sudden cardiac death acute myocardial infarction unstable angina rupture of high risk or vulnerable plaques is the cause the inner plaque material is exposed to the blood in the coronaries and that initiates the formation of platelet fibrin rich thrombus on the ruptured site the rupture may seal without any detectable sequelae or the rupture may invite thrombotic thrombus formation with total occlusion of the coronaries and patient may experience acute coronary syndrome or sudden cardiac death majority of the vulnerable plaques appear insignificant when you do a coronary angiogram before the rupture they do not show significant stenosis the significant stenosis is always less than 75% majority of the stenosis of more than 75% have no vulnerable plaques so this is the paradox which we have discussed in the opening slides in a given patient what are the prognostic factors to decide which patient of cad is severe enough and progresses and which patient is stable enough and will not have problems the first and foremost thing is the lv functional damage lv functional damage as evidenced by previous mi ecg evidence of pathological cues congestive heart failure cardiomegaly in the chest x ray decreased ejection fraction of less than 40% in the echocardiogram decreased end systolic volume left ventricular regional valve motion abnormalities in the echocardiography conduction disturbances in the ecg mitral regurgitation decreased exercise tolerance of less than 5 mets these all are indicative of substantial damage to the left ventricle and they are predictors of poor prognosis the other important aspect is the severity of the coronary artery disease where is the coronary artery disease located in this patient is it a single vessel disease is it a double vessel disease is it a triple vessel disease is the left main affected is it the left anterior descending depending on the site and the number of vessels the severity of the disease is determined and that decides the prognosis the degree of stenosis is it less than 50% is it 50 to 75% or is it more than 75% or is it more than 90% and the extent that is the length of the stenotic segment or up, obtrusive segment does he have transient ischemic episodes on the holter monitor which is a poor prognostic sign exercise testing induced st deviations again are poor predictors of prognosis progressive symptoms of ihd are also poor predictors of course increasing age is associated with poor prognosis there are certain modifiable risk factors which also indicate poor prognosis presence of diabetes uncontrolled hypertension dyslipidemia particularly ldl and lpa excessive weight smoking current smoking and other comorbidities other metabolic factors presence of ventricular arrhythmias all are indicative of poor prognosis what will be the blood pressure response like in a case of exercise testing in fact systolic blood pressure should raise at least 40 mm from the baseline the diastolic blood pressure should decline or remain stationary there will be a widening of the pulse pressure this is to accommodate the increasing demand on the cardiac output by the system a drop of more than 10 mm of systolic blood pressure is ominous and is an indication to terminate the exercise testing this is called exertional hypotension there is another measure called the double product double product is the maximum systolic blood pressure achieved multiplied by the maximum heart rate if the systolic blood pressure achieved is 170 let us say and the maximum heart rate let us say is 160 the double product will be 27200 a double product must be at least 
and anything less than that is indicative of poor cardiac reserve either the blood pressure has not gone up or the heart rate has not gone up or both of them have not shown the substantial increment with the exercise that is why the double product is less systolic blood pressure is a marker of the force of contraction or the ionotropic activity of the myocardium heart rate is a marker of the rate of the heart or the chronotropic activity of the myocardium the heart compensates for the extra demand by increasing the chronotropic and ionotropic response the chronotropic response of increasing the heart rate and the ionotropic response of increasing the systolic blood pressure double product is a measure a product of the increase in systolic pressure and the increase in the heart rate that is why double product is important measure for the cardiac work what is chronotropic incompetence when we subject a patient to exercise we expect the heart rate to go up to compensate for the requirement in the increased cardiac output to what extent this will go it depends on the age of the patient there is what is called the predicted maximum heart rate the predicted maximum heart rate for an individual is 220 minus the age of the individual let us say for example in a patient of 55 years the predicted maximum heart rate would be 220 minus 55 which is equal to 165 beats per minute then can everyone achieve 165 beats no if a person can achieve at least 90% of that predicted maximum heart rate that is good enough and that is what is called threshold heart rate threshold heart rate is equal to 90% of predicted maximum heart rate 90% of 165 in this patient which is equal to 148 supposing after the exercise or during the exercise his heart rate goes up to 148 there is good chronotropic response if we want to say that he has got chronotropic incompetence his heart rate increase should be less than 85% of the predicted maximum heart rate in this case 85% of the predicted maximum heart rate or 85% of 165 which is equal to 140 supposing this patient of 55 years has not got an increment in the heart rate beyond 140 we can clearly say that he has got chronotropic incompetence there is another index called the chronotropic index or the ci ci is equal to heart rate peak minus heart rate at rest heart rate peak is let's say he got 130 beats heart rate at rest let's say he has got 90 130 minus 90 is equal to 40 that divided by predicted maximum heart rate minus heart rate at rest predicted maximum heart rate in this particular patient is 165 his heart rate at rest is 90 165 minus 90 is equal to 75 so you divide that 40 with 75 you end up with an answer of 0.53 which is very low this must be at least 0.8 to say that the chronotropic index is normal if the chronotropic index is less than 0.8 in this particular example it is less than 0.8 very clearly 0.53 so there is a chronotropic deficiency or chronotropic and competence so either method we can calibrate the chronotropic incompetence either of the methods like the heart rate as we have seen the less than 80% or 85% of the predicted maximum heart rate or use the chronotropic index using the peak and resting heart rate and the predicted maximum heart rate what is heart rate recovery in exercise testing during peak exercise we would have seen the maximum heart rate from then during the recovery phase the heart rate comes back to the baseline heart rate this is what is called heart rate recovery how much is good enough that is the question during the first 2 minutes there must be a drop of at least 22 beats from the peak heart rate that is achieved supposing the patient has achieved a peak heart rate of 152 by 2 minutes time he must have at least 130 or less than that anything less than 22 beats in 2 minutes 
is strongly predictive of all cause mortality due to coronary artery disease and it is a poor prognostic indicator using the information obtained in the exercise testing we can compute a score and this is an internationally used and validated score called the duke's score and duke's score is equal to exercise time in minutes minus 5 times the st segment depression in millimeters minus 4 times the exercise and angina index exercise angina index is equal to 0 if there is no exercise angina 1 if there is exercise angina that occurred and 2 if the angina is severe enough to stop exercise testing so this code is worked out this way take the exercise time and subtract 5 times the st segment deviation in millimeters and again subtract 4 times the exercise angina index the resulting number is the duke score exercise time is based on the standard bruce protocol st deviation less than 1 mm is to be taken as 0 st deviation is equal to maximum exercise st change minus the baseline st segment level that is the difference between the baseline st segment and the maximum exercise st segment that is the exercise deviation that's how the duke score is complete and computed how to interpret it let us see the next slide based on the duke score we can classify the patients who did the ett into three groups those who are low risk groups the intermediate risk groups and the high risk groups if the duke score is less than or equal to minus 11 the patient falls under the high risk group 13% of patients fall in this group usually average annual cv mortality in them is more than or equal to 5% intermediate risk group the duke score will be between plus 4 to minus 10 53% of all patients fall in this group annual cv mortality is between 0.5% to 4% low risk group means the duke, duke score is more than or equal to plus 5 34% of patients fall in this group and average annual cv mortality is less than 0.05%. In fact, there is a nomogram called the Duke nomogram, treadmill score nomogram, which we can see in the next slide to interpret the Duke the results of the Duke score. This is the nomogram of Duke treadmill score. This nomogram is applicable to patients with known or suspected CAD without prior revascularization or recent mi who have undergone ett before the coronary angiography so in order to interpret the nomogram there are three steps the first step is to connect the angina during exercise line with the st segment de and deviation during exercise so pick up the point on the angina during exercise line let's say this patient had a non limiting angina that means he had pain but that did not limit the exercise testing to be stopped from that point let's say the patient had 2 mm of st depression from the baseline and that point is connected by a straight line now step 2 is the line that we have drawn earlier has intersected the ischemia reading line at a particular point and this patient let's say has done 7 mets of exercise or 6 minutes of exercise so that 7 mets point on the duration of exercise line and the intersected point on the ischemia reading line are connected by a straight line let us place that straight now step 3 is to read the prognosis in terms of probability of 5 year survival and average annual mortality the second line that we have drawn has intersected the prognosis line at a particular point and that point will give us two readings on the left hand side we see the five year survival rate as 98% 95% 97% 90% in this case it is just around 85% on the right hand side of that line we see the annual mortality in terms of 0.2% 0.4% 1% 1.5% 2% in this patient it's around 3% so this patient who has done 7 minutes of exercise who experienced 
non lipidic angina and who showed 2 mm of st depression when we applied the duke nomo duke nomogram has given us a prognosis estimate of 3% annual mortality and 85% five year survival that's how we interpret the nomogram there is another widely used scoring for treadmill this is called the va score va stands for veteran affairs administration hospital score and this prediction is different for men and women let's now look at the chart for the men there are several areas that we are looking at the maximal heart rate the exercise st depression the age of the patient the anginal history hypercholesterolemia diabetes exercise test result to induce angina all are taken into consideration to derive a summary total score depending on the maximum heart rate achieved the patient can score 30 points for 100 bpm 24 points for 100 to 129 bpm like that 190 to 100 220 bpm the score will be 6 points so for the second category exercise testing if there is 1 to 2 mm exercise st depression 15 points are given more than 2 mm 25 points less than 1 mm 0 points age more than 55 20 points 40 to 55 12 points less than 40 0 points anginal history typical angina 5 points atypical probable angina 3 points non anginal cardiac pain 1 point no pain 0 points hypercholesterolemia s yes, 5 no 0 diabetes s yes, means 5 points no means 0 exercise induced angina if it occurred 3 points if it was the reason to stop exercise testing 5 points if there is no exercise induced angina 0 points so we have to choose one of the answers for each of these groups and put the score there and summate all those points and the total score is derived if the total score is less than 40 it indicates low probability of coronary artery disease if it is between 40 and 60 it is intermediate probability if it is more than 60 it is high probability of coronary artery disease this is how the duke score is com- is computed for men let us look at the chart for women in the next slide this is the va score chart for women just as we have done for the men depending on the maximum heart rate achieved by the patient during the exercise the points are allotted from 20 points 16 points 12 points 8 points or 4 points depending on the number of beats the maximum heart rate that is achieved exercise st depression 1 to 2 mm 6 points more than 2 mm 10 points less than 1 mm or no depression 0 point age here in women more than 65 25 points 50 to 65 15 points less than 50 0 points angina history definite or typical angina 10 points a typical or probable angina 6 points non cardiac pain 2 points no chest pain at all 0 points estrogen status that means if the woman is menstruating or if she has got uterus intact you give her minus 5 because estrogen is protect protective and if the woman is already in menopause or the uterus is removed then we give plus 5 for the negative estrogen status diabetes yes in women 10 points no 0 points smoking yes in women 10 points no 0 points diabetes and smoking take away the advantage of the estrogen status of the women exercise induced angina if it occurred 9 points if it was the reason for stopping 15 points if it did not occur 0 points like that from each group we had to pick up one answer and give the points add all those points to get the summary total score if it is less than 37 low probability of cad 37 to 57 intermediate probability more than 57 high probability of cad it's how the va score for women is by interpreting the exercise treadmill test there are certain confounders which we have to remember if the patient is taking digoxin 
there will be abnormal ST segment depressions to the tune of 45 percent of the patients. Left ventricular hypertrophy decreases the specificity of the ETT. Resting ST depression is a marker of major acute coronary event. Left bundle branch block in that case the ST depression has a limited value in the ETT. Right bundle branch block had no effect but we have to monitor V3 to V6 and not V1 and V2 because RBB will be interfering with the interpretation if we use V1 and V2. Beta blockers when the patient is on beta blockers the heart rate response is decreased and they may not achieve the threshold heart rate. Calcium channel blockers they, de they decrease the chronotropic response. So, it is important for us to know the history of these parameters like digoxin, LVH, resting ST depression, LBB, RBB, beta blockers and calcium blockers before we interpret the ATT because these variables confirm with the interpretation. Okay, we have done exercise test in a given patient. How does it influence our decision making? If the ETT result is low risk, then the probability of coronary artery disease is less than 40 percent, the average mortality, annual mortality is less than 1 percent per year and the next step would be to continue on the medical treatment. Supposing the ETT result is intermediate, the probability of coronary artery disease is between 40 to 60 percent, average annual mortality is 2 to 3 percent, imaging modalities like stress echo or myocardial perfusion studies can be done or coronary angiogram can be ordered. In patients who are high risk, more than 60 percent probability of coronary artery disease, the annual average annual mortality is more than 4 percent, such patients should be referred for coronary angiogram as soon as possible. Suppose the patient has got other comorbidities like poor LV function, poor renal function, chronic kidney disease, poor lung function, carp pulmonial, things like that, whatever may be the probability of CAD, <coughs> whatever may be the risk level of annual mortality, we cannot recommend them for further studies and coronary angiogram and bypass grafts and medical treatment is the choice for such individuals. That is how the decision making, clinical decision making is influenced by the result of the exercise test. How good is the exercise ECG testing? In other words, what is the sensitivity and what is the specificity of the ATT? Gain Rosie et al. have published a beautiful article in the year 1989 in the journal Circulation. This is a study of a meta-analysis of 147 consecutive studies involving a huge number of patients, 24,000 patients. They have estimated that the ATT has got a sensitivity of 68 percent and a specificity of 77 percent. Sensitivity as we have already seen in the beginning slides is the ability to rule out the disease if the test is negative. Supposing the treadmill test is negative we can rule out coronary artery disease with a confidence of 68 percent. Specificity is spin that is if it is positive to rule in the disease. The treadmill test is positive. The predictability of that positive result is 78 percent or 77 percent as estimated by these things. So, a positive result of treadmill test rules in coronary artery disease in 79 percent of the cases and a negative treadmill result rules out coronary artery disease with a confidence of 68 percent. In other words, sensitivity 68 percent quite low, not as good as all of us wanted, but the specificity is reasonably good it's around 77 percent. What is the value of ATT in women? We know women coronary artery disease is much different from the coronary artery disease in men. The sensitivity of the ATT in men is around 60 65 percent, in women it is as low as 30 percent. 
Stress imaging is not the first alternative in women. Just as in men, exercise ECG testing is the first test. But remember a positive result, the specificity of confirming the disease is as good in men as in women. But the negative exercise testing result in women is not good enough compared to men to rule out disease if the test is negative. Multiple CV risk factors, severe long standing diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, chronic kidney disease are also indications for doing an exercise test and see whether the cardiac circuit is also compromised. Routinely in asymptomatic men or women without any CV risk factors, doing ETT is not indicated. The false positive ETT results in such individuals may result in unwanted further testing and treatment procedures and so it precludes the use of ETT as a routine test for asymptomatic individuals. Sometimes we need to use ETT in patients who suffered myocardial infarction. Risk stratification and assessment of prognosis are based on the ETT results. Functional capacity for activity level after discharge and, and, and for prescribing the amount of activity the patient has to undertake either at home or at work is dependent upon the results of the exercise testing. Assessment of the adequacy of medical treatment is also sometimes done using exercise testing. Sometimes it is important to decide further diagnostic and treatment options in a patient who suffered myocardial infarction. In such cases, ETT may be useful. Remember that ETT in MI is safe, but not immediately after MI, but after 2 to 3 weeks of time. Fatal reinfarctions and cardi cardiac rupture have been reported, but the occurrence is very low. 0.03%. Non-fatal recurrent infarction with recovery occurs at a rate of 0.09%. Complex arrhythmias including ventricular tachycardia is reported in 1.4% of patients who had previous MI when they are subjected to exercise testing. So keeping these things in mind, it is important for us to decide whether we go for an exercise testing in a patient of MI and if so, what is the information that we are going to get it, get out of it and how we use it for planning the treatment and, and for prognosticating the patient's future. Thank you my dear friends. Let me summarize by saying that we have seen the various aspects of exercise testing like the pre-test probability the sensitivity and specificity of a test, how to work out those numbers, what is the spectrum of coronary artery disease, how important it is for us to understand the indications of ATT, the contraindications of ATT, the rules for terminating ATT when something goes wrong and then the important measurements like the maximum heart rate that is re reached, the maximum systolic blood pressure, the exercise capacity in terms of METs and then the angina index and the ST segment depressions and combining all those things into a scoring system like Duke score or VA score or using the nomogram of Duke score and predicting the probability of the disease as very low or intermediate or high. It is important for us to choose which patient should go for ATT. All those who have an intermediate probability only are to be tested for ATT. And the end result has to be classified again as low probability, intermediate probability or high probability and a recommendation for further testing, medical management or for CAG. That is how the whole story has unfolded remembering that the sensitivity of 
exercise testing is comparatively low around 62 percent the specificity is good enough around 70 to 78 percent with these few words i close my talk and once again thank you all for your patient listening of this i hope you had insight you had an insight into the various intricacies of this particular test which has to be commonly applied and judiciously used by us thank you these are some of the international references and internet resources on exercise testing among the various references that i could put my hand on the one published by the american college of cardiology the clinical guidelines for exercise is the most comprehensive one it is around 80 page document summarizing all the details of exercise testing the indications contraindications the rationale interpretations the scoring and everything that we have covered there's another article published in www.emedicine.com under the medical topics on exercise testing and its utility this is again a summary article taken from the earlier publication which i have suggested so i would suggest you to go through all these references the time does not permit at least look into the two important references which are singled out here on this slide 